us today, Dr. Michael Boswell. Uh, he's from Cal Poly down in San Luis Obispo, who is part of a team working on developing this, Cal this policy guide. It's a climate action, action pl planning process, and Dr. Boswell will talk about the process and the development of this guide, which I think you'll find very interesting. So, Dr. Boswell. Okay, so sounds good. All right, well, um, thank you for uh, having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak about the, the work that I've been doing. Uh, as you can see on the slide, uh, in addition to myself, uh, there's uh, Dr. Adrian Grieve, um, who's been heading up the adaptation uh, policy guide work uh, that we're doing with the state of California, but she had committed previously to another conference, but I got the better deal because she's in Colorado, I think, uh, choking on the smoke from the wildfires. So um, I got to come to nice green uh, Arcata. So um, uh, just quickly on my background, I'm a professor of city and regional planning uh, at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. And over the past several years, uh, the primary work I've been doing is on climate action planning. Uh, along with Professor Grieve and a, a practitioner named Tammy Seal, we uh, published a book called Local Climate Action Planning that basically tells uh, communities how they can go about uh, uh, putting together a climate action plan to prepare for climate change. Uh, and then most recently, uh, with Professor Grieve and some other folks uh, at Cal Poly and in various state agencies, we've been putting together a guide uh, for communities on how they can uh, prepare for the effects of climate change. And um, I'll go over some nomenclature in a moment, and there's not a lot of you here, so feel free to just ask me questions. I don't mind you interrupting or um, I'll just raise your hand if I use a wonky term or something of that nature. We can stay pretty informal here today, even though I wore a tie, which I'm, I think I'm the only person here. I was told you're not supposed to wear ties in Humboldt County. Is that is that true? So. Yeah, uh, I wear it on my head. That's what I should have done, yeah. That, well, that's for later, I think. Uh, after we have the evening reception, I'll have it on my head. Um, okay, let's see. All right. Looks good. Um, just uh, before I get into the, uh, the adaptation work, the most recent work that we've been doing, I, I want to uh, create a sort of a larger uh, framework or a larger picture for what it is that we're ultimately trying to uh, to accomplish at least in our work. So I'm going to split the presentation up into three parts. I'm going to give a little bit of introduction to make sure we have some, a similar conceptual frame. I'm going to talk a little bit about GHG emissions reduction, but not too much. That's not why I was asked to come here, but it's an important part of the equation. And then I'll focus the bulk of the presentation on this adapting to climate change. Okay. Um, I always start out with uh, a theme. And my theme uh, that, that uh, in most of my talks is that when we talk about doing climate action planning or, or dealing with uh, the climate change problem in our communities, when we talk about climate action planning, what we're really talking about is good city planning. Many of the ideas, many of the solutions uh, to the climate change problem are things that we've been talking about for 30, 40, 50 years uh, in city planning. So we've heard some speakers uh, last night and today talk about the time it takes to make uh, changes, and I think that's um, very evident uh, in this sort of theme. Uh, you know, things like, you know, alternative transportation and renewable energy, these aren't new ideas. We've been talking about these for a long time, and we've known for a long time these can be important components to creating great communities. Um, so when I talk about climate action planning, even though we're focusing on a narrow specific challenge in our communities, uh, really the things that we ultimately will do uh, I see is simply good city planning and things we probably should have been doing, you know, 40 years ago or starting to do 40 years ago. Um, climate action plans, well, they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, well, actually, they're usually eight and a half by 11. But at any rate, they come with different covers at least. And um, climate action planning is a phenomenon that uh, is now occurring all over the United States. Um, over a thousand communities in the U.S. have committed to doing some form of climate action planning. And something on the order of about 300 to 350 have either done it or in the process of doing climate action planning. Um, of course, there's something like 10,000 uh, units of government uh, in the United States, so, or, or excuse me, 18,000 units of government. So we've got a ways to go. 
but a lot of the major cities have been doing it. So here's just some examples, some from California, uh, some from places like uh, Nashville, and even, even Houston, Texas, the global capital of the oil and gas industry, uh, has done uh, essentially a climate action plan. So certainly if Houston can do it, anybody else can. Um, what are these things, climate action plans? Well, they're strategic plans, and by that we mean they're focused on a particular issue. Uh, in this case, the problem or the challenge of climate change, global warming. Um, and they usually are designed to uh, address two things within a community. Uh, one is to identify how a community can reduce its greenhouse gas emissions, right? This is the problem, size, uh, problem side. I'll have a, a graphic in a moment. To reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and this is where most of the attention has been up to this point. Um, if we look at most of the climate plans that have been done around the country, they're almost exclusively aimed at the issue of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it's the sexier topic these days. But that's beginning to change. And now many communities, and there's a, a tremendous renewed interest, or not renewed, but new interest in also addressing the other component of the climate change problem, uh, which is what climate change will do to our communities. Now, some people say, well, you know, hey, that's sort of giving up or giving in to the problem and we just need to stop climate change and, and then we don't have to worry about dealing with it in our communities. Uh, the only problem with that is we're already suffering the effects and impacts of climate change today. So even if we turned off all of our fossil fuel burning tomorrow, which we know is not going to happen, we would still have the effects of climate change and have to deal with them. So communities are beginning to uh, now address not only how do we reduce our emissions, um, but also how do we uh, uh, prepare for the impacts of climate change. Now, uh, I put this up just in case, um, I'm, uh, I usually start out say, by telling you what I'm not going to talk about. Uh, I'm not going to talk about two things today. I'm not going to talk about the science of climate change. Uh, I'm not a climatologist, I'm a, I'm a city planner. Um, and I'm not going to spend too much time, I'll give you a few examples on the gloom and doom impacts to California. Uh, uh, partly, one, because that depresses me. Uh, and two, I think we've heard a fair amount between last night and this morning about that already. Uh, but again, a little bit of terminology uh, in case that you're new to this area. If you look at the inside of the, of the circle, um, there's sort of two phenomena we're interested in. Uh, one is that cities emit greenhouse, gas, uh, greenhouse gases, and this is because we burn fossil fuels and that puts carbon dioxide and uh, other chemicals into the air. Uh, these things trap heat and cause global warming, all right? So that's the 101 version or even the shorter version. Uh, so our communities, the way we've built them, the, w the things that we do in these communities, we drive cars, we heat our homes, those things are creating greenhouse gas emissions, which is creating the climate change or the global warming problem. That problem, which is a global scale problem, though manifests itself locally uh, with a variety of impacts. And so these global warming changes come back and affect our communities in a whole variety of ways. And it depends on uh, where our community is and what it's like. Uh, the main drivers of uh, the main impacts from climate change being temperature, precip precipitation, changes, and sea level rise. In terms of terminology, and there's a little bit of a confusion in terminology here, uh, we're good in the English language of you know, creating words that mean different, same words that mean different things. We're very good at that in, this, in English, aren't we? We have lots of things like that. Um, so to clarify a little bit of the terminology, when we're dealing with the problem of putting greenhouse gas emissions into the air from our behavior, the way we live in our communities, uh, if we're trying to solve that problem, it's called climate change mitigation. Right? So in other words, we're trying to mitigate or reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions we're putting into the air. Um, if we're trying to solve the other problem, which is the impacts of climate change to our communities, we call this um, adaptation, okay? So mitigation and adaptation. Again, I'm gonna talk a little bit about mitigation and then focus on adaptation. Um, we've done quite a bit of work of, of talking to communities and surveying communities around the US to find out why they're doing what they're doing. And I thought this was an interesting um, uh, finding that I'd uh, share with you. Uh, one of the reasons, one of the things we did was we want all these communities that are doing climate action planning, we want to know why they were doing it. So we asked them, why are you doing this? Did somebody tell you you have to do it or 
you know, what happened. Uh, and we basically kind of got eight reasons uh, that were given to us. Um, I'll briefly explain these. Global leadership, this is sort of the ethical thing. Hey, we're citizens of the world. It's our responsibility to do our share to try to solve uh, this global crisis, right? It's kind of an ethical commitment. Uh, grant funding, some communities said, hey, our state has grants, you know, for whatever. If you have a climate action plan or you're doing climate planning. So, you know, local governments are desperate for money. Uh, so they saw this as an economic opportunity. Uh, some communities said, hey, we want to create uh, an image of a green community, right? We want to be able to go out there. You know, Portland and Minneapolis are in this, you know, battle over who's the most bike-friendly city in America. And there's a lot of civic pride tied up in it. Um, some communities, mostly in California, are responding to state policy direction. The state of California has the most aggressive state policies pushing communities to do uh, climate action planning of any of the 50 states in the country, um, and, and pretty well ahead of most of the others as well. Uh, some say we're doing it for energy efficiency. Uh, some say we're doing it, or some say we've been doing a bunch of stuff already, but we're trying to better coordinate it all, so that we call that strategic planning. Uh, some simply said, look, our, you know, our community doesn't know much about this, doesn't care much about it, so we're simply trying to get, build public awareness. Uh, and some said that um, we're interested in making our communities more resilient to the impacts of climate change. Anybody want to guess what the most popular reason was? Pretty much by far, not by far, but it was, it was a clear winner. Several lengths ahead, for sure. Grant funding. State policy, no, no, I thought it was going to be state policy, is energy efficiency, uh, which is also can be interpreted as saving money. So most communities that said the reason we're doing climate planning is we realize that it's a way to do, be more energy efficient and save money. Uh, we, th uh, we also thought maybe it'd be global leadership, you know, everybody say we're doing it to save the planet. No, hardly anybody said that. Yes, sir. Well, uh, just quickly, the, we have a variety of things in California. Most notably, we have the Global Warming Solutions Act, or what sometimes is called AB 32, Assembly Bill 32. Uh, that is the most uh, prominent piece of uh, uh, legislation we have directing a whole host of actions to address climate change in the state of California. And again, no other state has something, well, Massachusetts has something similar. They're probably the next behind us. And then after that, it really begins to fall off. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, s official state action. Uh, we also had, uh, there's a variety of other pieces of legislation. There was a, an executive order by Governor Schwarzenegger that really kicked a lot of this in motion as well. And then some of the work I'll talk about in a moment where the state agencies are being asked to step up and provide additional or provide help and technical assistance to communities to do this kind of work. So it's come through, you know, we don't have, um, there's not sort of, you know, the Office of Climate Change and the one giant piece of legislation that sort of commands and controls this whole process. For California, it's been very incremental over 20 years, uh, but it's all adding up to a very um, uh, substantial uh, bit of public policy that, again, is not, there's not a comparison in the rest of the country. In fact, California at this point is now an international leader uh, in this regard. Most countries don't even have the level of legislation that California now has in terms of directing action on climate change. Um, okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about emissions reduction. If you have questions, you can ask, but I'll kind of go quickly through this. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this. This is an international nonprofit organization. Uh, ICLE used to stand for something, but they stopped using that. And, but they kept their acronym, which is horrible. Um, but they're, they also call themselves Local Governments for Sustainability. But you can go to their website. They have all kinds of stuff. Uh, most communities that are doing climate planning have been following uh, this uh, five-step process. And I'll go through um, a couple of these uh, basic uh, first steps. Oh. Um, the first thing they say is, uh, as a community, uh, you should inventory your emissions. Um, and so I've got um, my county, Slow County's uh, example here, although I looked at Humboldt County and it was not very dissimilar and not surprisingly so. The counties are similar in uh, certain ways. Um, uh, I know that uh, the city of Arcata has one as well. I haven't looked at it. 
Uh, I know Trinidad recently is working on a climate plan. Arcata has a climate plan, by the way. I think it was done in 2006. Uh, it needs to be updated. So go to your city council and don't tell them I sent you. I don't want nasty letters coming back to me. But that's your job anyways. You're citizens of this community. So uh, maybe they're already updating it. And uh, Humboldt County, I believe, is right now in the process of, of updating theirs as part of their general plan update. Is that true? Does anybody know? I heard there's been some political controversy over it. Not surprising. Oh, this is good. Okay, so that's a good question. So it, emissions inventories. Well, we don't directly measure emissions. There's not like a bunch of monitoring stations around the border of the county that f sort of figure out how many, how much greenhouse gases uh, emissions we're emitting. Although there is some scientific work being done to use satellites to do just that very thing. Right now we do it indirectly, we uh, measure activity. So for example, to figure out transportation emissions, we say, well, you know, here's the vehicle fleet in this county, and here's how much people drive that vehicle fleet, and here's the kind of fuel they use in it. And it's a fairly complex set of uh, equations. Well, actually not that complex, but uh, it's, a, it's technical work to be done to then estimate, okay, based on all of that, we can say, Here's how much uh, you know, carbon dioxide per year is being emitted. Uh, same thing for uh, electrical uh, use and heating. And so it's really a data challenge, getting all this data together. And then there's some basic uh, formulas and, and processes uh, to analyze the data and come up with the emissions uh, count. Uh, and so this just shows an example of a distribution. Uh, and so County is very typical in the sense that transportation is always a big chunk of, of, of our emissions. This is our you know, burning fossil fuels in our cars. Uh, and then electric, electricity and heating um, gas and oil use in the residential and commercial industrial section. Uh, you know, cows do their part as well. So County, we have a fair amount of cattle. Uh, and uh, they deliver methane from both ends, as they say. All right, so once we've got an emissions um, inventory, Uh, once we've got an emissions um, inventory, the, typically the next step would be to forecast the future emissions. Uh, this example is from the city of San Carlos, uh, and you can just sort of, I'll point out kind of the key, key uh, pieces here. If you look at the straight red dash line, uh, that's the amount of emissions uh, for the city of San Carlos in the year 2005. And that's in metric tons of uh, what they call CO2 equivalent, so it's just a way to measure CO2. So 250 some odd, 260,000 metric tons per year. That number is not important, but that's what they call their baseline. The red line uh, sloping upwards is the forecast for the future. And this is simply based on the idea that San Carlos anticipates to grow, uh, people to continue to drive, in fact, drive more because that's the trend in the US. Vehicle miles traveled have, have gone up uh, in, over time. So San Carlos is saying, you know, if we did nothing, business as usual, uh, and just sort of let things play out as they do now, our emissions will increase uh, by about, what is that, uh, 100, well, over 100,000 uh, by 2030. Um, San Carlos wants to reduce emissions, so they've got a purple dash line that it shows their reduction target. Uh, that's what they want to hit by 2030. Um, and so you often hear this term, the wedge. Have you heard this term, the wedge, or the wedges, the wedge strategy? Uh, this is the wedge. The wedge is the difference between where San Carlos will be if they do nothing and where they want to be. And that distance between those two emissions levels is the amount of emissions that they have to reduce by 2030. And you can see that's a lot. Uh, that's uh, quite a bit of emissions. Uh, reduction. So no small feat in 2030. That used to seem like a long time from now, but that's 18 years away uh, to have a, a significant reduction in emissions. And this is a typical uh, level of uh, desired goal. Um, now the green line that's uh, kind of obscured now at the bottom curving down uh, is their forecast. If, if San Carlos does everything they've identified in their, in their plan, for reducing GHG emissions, they believe that's where they'd be. So they'd effectively hit their target. Uh, oh, I don't want to have to explain that to you. Um, 
All right, so if you were to crack open one of these climate action plans, like the San Carlos one, and look and see uh, what is it, what are they planning to do, you would find that their actions were uh, typically within four areas. Now, there are other areas, but these are the big four. Uh, transportation, uh, of course, and you saw that that was a big piece of the pie. Land use, which really is ultimately about transportation. The reason we drive so much is because of the way we've designed and built our communities. Um, energy efficiency and renewable energy. So these four areas would capture probably 90 plus percent of the policies in these plans and would, um, when you looked at all, adding up all those emissions reductions you could get from these policies, uh, about 90 percent would fall in that area. Uh, this is, uh, on the right, just an example. I think that's from the city of Benicia uh, down in the Bay Area uh, in terms of how they broke out their topic areas of where they were going to try um, to make change. Um, some of these uh, climate plans that we've looked at have, you know, 200 different actions that the community is planning on taking. Um, one key point before I move on to the adaptation stuff that I want to make uh, is the notion of co-benefits. Uh, co-benefits has really become uh, the, 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 um, the key element for moving climate plans forward, particularly politically. Um, as you know, I'm sure everybody here in the room, we can sing Kumbaya, we're all more or less probably on the same page, but as we know, the folks out there, there's a lot of folks who aren't on the same page. Um, a lot of folks uh, don't want to do uh, take action on uh, climate change. They don't believe in climate change. And so uh, I gave you that idea right at the beginning of my presentation that climate action planning is good city planning. And it comes down to this notion of co-benefits, that nearly everything that we identify that we would want to do uh, in a climate action plan um, has a, a co-benefit, it has some other benefit. Uh, if you are here last night, um, th did you see the cartoon? I love that cartoon, I should put it in my, my presentation, where um, uh, the, the gist of the cartoon is that, you know, if, if we take all these actions and it turns out that climate change isn't real, you know, we're stuck with really great communities. Um, and that's kind of the idea here that, um, you know, the notion of, for example, getting people to ride their bicycles more as a form of transportation. Well, that's good for climate change. It helps us reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, but also reduces traffic congestion, and it's good for our health, right? So, and it's fun. If you ride your bike, riding your bike can be fun. So um, looking at co-benefits, and there's all kinds of co-benefits, whether they're economic, whether they're health, whether they're revenue, um, and, you know, uh, that you can really get to people when you can say, hey, you may not believe in climate change, but you know, if you insulate your house better, here's how much money you're going to save and here's how much more comfortable you're going to be in your house. That rings true to a lot of people. Yes, sir, the other question. Yes, this is, a, uh, this is a bit of an odd one. Most climate plans will address water and you may have, I think, it, I think it's in the county's emissions inventory. Um, one of the major sources of electricity consumption in the state of California is to do what? Pump water. Pump water. Move water around the state. Um, don't quote me on this. Camera's on. Darn. I think I read the other day that something like 18% of our electricity use in California is to move water. Maybe that's too high. I don't know. But anyways, we use a lot of electricity to move water in this state. Um, and, and so that's, that's the difference. If we can move less water around, we will use less electricity uh, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's not in total, if you look at our total greenhouse gas emissions and how much is associated with water, it's not a huge chunk of the equation, but it is a piece and every little piece counts, of course, because like I said, most communities in order to get to their reduction targets are looking at you know, 20, 30, 50, 100 different actions that will need to be taken. Because there's no, there's no do this and you're done, right? It's do all these little things and they'll ultimately add up to get us to where we um, need to be. Yeah, here, in so, brown. So related to the water reduction and use and the power, one of the problems I see is that these are products and these companies want to sell more of the products. Yeah, but in the state of California, PG&E doesn't make more money when they sell more power. 
Uh, in fact, uh, California has a regulatory scheme now uh, such that uh, energy providers uh, don't want to have don't want to have to sell any more power than they sell now. Because to sell more power, they have to make huge capital investments at this point. Uh, so not every state has that, but we have that in the state of California. So it's actually not in PG&E's interest to sell any more power, which is why they're interested in energy efficiency. I don't know, you know, this happened, I don't know when this happened in California. Is it about 20 years ago? Does anybody know? Um, suddenly PG&E got all interested in energy efficiency. Well, what now? Maybe it was out of the goodness of their heart. I don't want to, I don't want to speak for them. I'm certainly not representative of them, but, um, but uh, there's a reason they got interested in energy efficiency. Yeah. Water companies are a little different. Although usually city municipal water systems don't want to sell more water because again, the capital cost of obtaining more water. We just uh, developed a new water supply in um, San Luis Obispo County. I think we'll be paying the bond for 40 years. It's incredibly expensive to develop water. It's a, mo it's a money loser. Yeah. Um, all right, a few challenges to leave you with on the emissions reduction side. One is, it kind of came up in the question, is that it's a very technical process um, of figuring out how to, re, uh, how, to re, how to account for emissions and how to account for how much each policy or program will reduce our emissions. Um, there's a lot of guidance that's out and available now, but it is a technical challenge for us uh, in terms of doing the accounting. Uh, a little more um, uh, social uh, challenge uh, is the global scale issue, the, the, the idea that we're talking about um, a, a global abstract problem. It's a very difficult for people to, you know, sort of get excited about the issue um, of climate change because they simply don't see it as something that's relevant to their uh, daily lives, right? It's a global problem. It's, you know, you, you read the forecast and they say things like, by 2100, this will happen. Well. By 2100, I'm dead, so who cares? Uh, so the scale of the problem really overwhelms our sense of our own sort of personal uh, interest in space. Um, a third challenge is changing behavior. Uh, when you look at what is suggested in many of the climate action plans, you'll see that a lot of the policies and actions that we need to take really involve changing behavior. You know, it's one thing to say we're going to put solar panels on City Hall. All right? Okay, fine. Allocate the money, write the check, hire a contractor, good to go. It's another thing to say, we're going to increase uh, bicycle transportation mode share from its current 2% to 20%, which some communities are talking about trying to do. All right? That's not a matter of buying some stuff or reallocating some resource. That's getting us to behave differently, and that's a lot harder. Uh, and so a lot of the... Uh, 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 challenges for doing climate action plan are around changing behavior. It's harder to do and it takes a lot, quite a bit longer to do. And then the final one that's of shock to no one is funding, of course. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time interviewing uh, this year local governments and asking them how implementation of their plans is going. And a lot of them are going, what implementation? All right? We don't have any money. We're, we, we can barely keep the lights on in the city, as you know, in California. We're now looking at possibly uh, as many as six cities being uh, bankrupt uh, this year. So funding remains a challenge. Okay, so let me switch gears and go to the adaptation side. But my one of my segue points is, I, I think there's a few reasons that there that there's a renewed interest in adaptation, uh, with several. But one of them, I believe, is that it doesn't suffer as much that global. Um, scale problem and that people are beginning to sense that uh, climate change is beginning to affect their personal lives, right? That they're being impacted uh, by that. Um, we can see that with the extreme weather events over the past year, for example, um, people beginning to take more of a personal interest. Um, so the question was, what is the state doing? Well, this is the project we've been working on most recently, uh, which we're going to change the name, by the way, to Adaptation Planning Guide, I believe. but. Uh, started out as the California Climate Change Adaptation Policy Guide. Um, it's a, it's really, the project is really uh, the work of the California Emergency Management Agency and the California Natural Resources Agency, but we're assisting them with all of the um, heavy lifting. Uh, basically, these two agencies uh, were able to get some grant money uh, aimed at doing climate adaptation. 
And what they decided to do uh, was to prepare uh, tools and resources and guidance for local communities on how they could begin to prepare um, climate adaptation uh, plans. Uh, so that we're in the very final stages of that. It'll be out on the streets in a, um, in a, in a few weeks. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's in there. Uh, the place I want to start, though, uh, and I hope that the, uh, that the audience, uh, that you, the audience, say will appreciate this point, is that we see the key to doing effective adaptation planning uh, is not to say, you know, go get the, uh, you know, go get one of the engineers out of the city public works department throw this thing on their desk and tell them to crank us out a plan in four months and, and we'll adopt it. Uh, we think that is not um, an appropriate strategy for doing climate adaptation planning. Instead, what we suggest is that communities need to start by putting together climate action, uh, climate adaptation teams. Uh, now, at a minimum, these teams should be uh, interagency teams within the community uh, you know, people from planning departments, engineering, public works, emergency management, utilities, uh, that sort of thing. You can see a list here. Uh, but really, we go beyond that and say, you know, a really effective climate action, uh, climate adaptation team is also going to include uh, uh, members uh, of the community and particularly interest groups from the community uh, who have interest in the potential impacts of climate change or who have uh, technical advice or information uh, to offer. Uh, so we suggest that uh, communities put together these teams that include, you know, non-governmental organizations uh, as well as uh, government agencies. And I'll explain a little bit why we think that works better as we go through. Uh, I don't know how well you're going to be able to see this. This is uh, some of these are taken right out of the document, so they produce well on paper, but not necessarily in PowerPoint. Um, I'm not going to go through all these steps, or I won't go through them exactly this way, but. I uh, just wanted to highlight that we uh, basically have a nine-step process that we've identified. Uh, the top half of it is, is the sort of the technical part, uh, and we'll walk through some of that. And the bottom half is really the kind of the, the putting the strategies or the ideas of how we're going to solve the problem uh, part together. So um, let me just skip on to the graphic. It's a little bit easier to read. Um, so I want to start with the technical part, which is the vulnerability assessment. Um, the first question, you know, once you've got your team put together, the sort of, uh, you know, first obvious question to ask is, well, what does climate change mean to our community? Uh, climate change does not mean the same thing to all communities. Uh, my colleague Adrian Greve is in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, Boulder, Colorado could care less about sea level rise, right, for obvious reasons. Uh, but they, I bet this year they care a whole heck of a lot about wildfire. Um, so communities are going to vary in terms of their vulnerability to climate change and in terms of what they care about and want to assess. So one of the first things to say is say, hey, what, what's potentially going to happen to us, if anything? Uh, we definitely know already that, that there are communities across the U.S. Uh, and across the globe who will see e either very little change uh, due to climate change or in some cases it might improve things. Uh, I don't like cold weather. I grew up in Florida. Uh, so I don't know, it seems like Fargo, North Dakota is going to benefit from climate change in my perspective. They may feel differently, but um, I couldn't take the cold weather up there. But anyway, some communities uh, have potentially identified, hey, climate change might be good for us because it might change the weather in ways that makes us more, uh, more productive crop region, for example. But for most communities, that's not going to be the case. Most communities are going to suffer negative impacts, and uh, we believe that basically every community in California will be suffering uh, negative impacts. All right, so I want to talk through uh, uh, this chart, and I'll explain it as I go, but I'm going to start with exposure and sensitivity. All right, so we want to figure out what's the issue for our community. So the first two questions are questions about exposure uh, and sensitivity. Uh, by exposure, um, suddenly now it's not advancing. Okay, there we go. Uh, by exposure, uh, the way you can think about this is what are we going to be exposed to in terms of the changes um, to the climate? And there's usually three, uh, the three main drivers that we want to consider uh, are sea level rise, uh, precipitation, and temperature. 
Um, you can see here that uh, depending on uh, which sort of climate model you look at, uh, by 2100, we're expecting about 1.4 meters of sea level rise in, in California, and there's a lot of uh, debate over that. You know, what are the error bars on that? We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, precipitation. Uh, precipitation is the is the one we know the least about. Um, uh, we don't have the science. I should say too here. This is a good time to point out that the science on this is not where we want it to be yet. Uh, you know, we really need something like a Manhattan Project for climate science uh, to figure this stuff out. We simply, we have a pretty good sense of at the global scale what's going to happen, but we have, um, we don't have good ability to say what's going to happen here in this county or in this city. It's called downscaling um, or downsampling these global models. And the, uh, the, the level of sophistication that we really want to have in order to do effective planning, we do not have yet we probably won't have for a while. Um, so with that said, though, we do have science available and we have to make the best use of, of, of what we have um, on hand at the, at, at the moment. Precipitation is one of these areas where we have the least confidence uh, in terms of what might happen. There's some areas in California where we don't know if it will, we'll see more precipitation or less precipitation. But that makes it hard to plan for when you've got that level of variability. Temperature, we know much, uh, we have a much clearer sense of what might happen with temperature uh, over time. So those are uh, uh, the big three. Actually, I'm going to skip ahead a slide. Uh, and I'll come back to the other one. Um, there are other things, exposure, exposure to what? Uh, like I said, sea level rise, precipitation, and temperature. Uh, there's also wind or, or changing storm patterns. Uh, we know much less about that. There's ocean acidification. Uh, this is also an area that we, we simply don't know enough about yet. We know it's happening. We know it's likely to be exacerbated, um, but we, we really need more science here. And there's a lot of activity now in ocean acidification, so we probably will know quite a bit more in the next five years, I suspect. Um, those are kind of direct impacts of, of the changing climate. Um, but we have a whole set of indirect uh, impacts. Uh, wildfire, changes of wildfire are going to be are going to occur because temperature and precipitation will change. And temperature and precipitation will also drive changes in the landscape in terms of what kind of plants and things. Uh, landslide, species migration, erosion, you see the list here. So there's a number of indirect impacts uh, in addition to the direct impacts of um, sea level rise, uh, precipitation, and temperature. Yes? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we've actually got a longer version of these lists that have like 60 different potential things on them. There's a whole set of potential things that might occur um, as we see uh, uh, the impacts of climate change. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, actually, we don't. I don't have it on this slide, but in the in the guidance, we have a whole section on agriculture and what the potential impacts are to agriculture and food systems. Um, absolutely. Um, yeah, drought is a big concern. Wheat and corn prices that are some of their highest levels we've seen. Um, so yeah, there's there's more. This is a, a sample list. Uh, I didn't want to put 60 up there. So <laughs> I, did, I did this. Uh, I used to do this. Uh, we did some other work on hazard mitigation, and and we asked every community in California to tell us what, what natural hazards their community was suspect to. And we had a list of 12 we were using for the state of California. And when we were done asking all the communities, we had a list of 55. Um, and I was like, wow, I could have never named. You could have given me a year. I have not come up with 55. Uh, so anyways, yes, there's uh, quite a bit more uh, here. And um, uh, we've got a lot of detail, uh, a couple hundred pages, I think, in our in a, one of the appendices for adaptation guide on, uh, on what they are. Yeah, so that's just a brief list of some examples. Um, oh, let me jump back to the slide I skipped. Okay, so when we ask about exposure, um, what are we asking about exposure? Well, uh, and I'll give you, I'll show you a good example of this uh, in a little bit. Um, one thing we want to know is the difference from current conditions. Right? I mean, we have a certain precipitation uh, and temperature regime uh, in this area, and we want to know how different is it going to be uh, from now. I mean, 
some places are hot already and they're going to stay hot and maybe get a little bit hotter and uh, it's usually the difference that matters right because that's going to the, the difference will change the way um, we do things uh, the speed of the onset how quickly are things going to change uh, is this a problem that will change in the next couple of years or is it going to be a hundred years from now are you gonna are you gonna help help me out or help you out. Pass yeah oh pass around the microphone awesome idea um, so how fast will these changes occur? Uh, spatial variation, in other words, uh, you know, is take this county for example, are the changes gonna be uniform across the county or are they gonna vary uh, spatially? Uh, the extent of the impact uh, or how big the impact is and then certainty, right? To what level of certainty do we know this impact will happen? Do we think it might happen, we don't know, or do we know from our science that yes, this will definitely uh, affect us? So there's some of the kinds of questions we might ask about exposure. Now to, to answer those, here goes, here goes the hard part of the presentation. I have to switch programs. It's not the best display of the web page, but it'll work. We can, we can use it. Uh, if you want to write this down, you can look at this yourself. Uh, this is CalAdapt. Uh, this is a, 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 a product of the, from the state of California as part of this effort. Um, this uh, is a tool, um, an internet and, and map-based tool for looking at the impacts of climate change. Um, it reflects the best consensus science we have right now. It does not have in it any of the latest cutting-edge science because we have to kind of make, review and make sure that stuff is correct before we sort of endorse it. And um, uh, it doesn't include any specific studies that have been done locally. And for example, I know uh, there's been a, um, a sea level rise study done for this region uh, that's more detailed than the broader state level study. So many regions have done, have gone beyond this, but it's good for an initial snapshot and it's really good for communities who haven't done anything else. This is going to be their go-to uh, site. So I just thought I'd show you a few things. I'm going to do a local profile here. Uh, I have no idea how fast the internet is in here. It could be really slow on these maps. Uh, not too bad. Okay. And let's... Um, okay. This Mac is different from mine. All right. Get some of that on the screen. Um, okay, so uh, you can go to the CalAdapt tool, you can put in, you can look at the whole state if you want, or you can put in um, a local jurisdiction. So it's zoomed in more or less uh, here on the community. I think I can select the county if I can get the... So um, while, I'm, while I've got it here, uh, what I can uh, show you is that what it's showing here is um, uh, it's got the low emissions scenario and the high emissions scenario. I'm not going to get into explanation of that, but there are various models that do different forecast and so we typically instead of forecasting a single point we say there's a potential range of variation in the future um, and uh, there's more information on the website you can read all about these models if you want uh, but what this is showing uh, for the county for Humboldt County uh, is different emission scenarios I'm not sure I can read it but you can basically see from 1960 to 2000 the historic uh, change in this case this is daily annual average temperature um, and you can see what's expected to change under the low emission scenario and the high emission scenario, okay? So you can see by, for example, by, I believe it's, this, this one goes, I guess, to 2080, um, under the high emissions, an increase in average annual temperature of five degrees, uh, which sort of seems like not a lot. I mean, if it was five degrees warmer in here, we'd be like, okay, whatever. Um, but that's a lot. Uh, in terms, because remember that's the average, which means the variability around that is going to be increased more significantly. Is there somebody said? That's just for our area, based on. This one's just for Humboldt County. You can select, you can zone. I forget the scale. It's something like 50 miles squares or something. Um, you can do the state, you can do a county, that sort of thing. The tool has some flexibility. I'm not going to show you all the things on the tool, but I could, I could say, tell me July average low temperature and change over time, July average high temperature and change over time. Um, what's that? World Th yeah, this is not emissions. This is the effect of emissions. Yeah, right. But I mean, the world... Yeah, it's the effect of the global emissions. Yeah, that's a, this is a good point. I, um, you know, 
your your local emissions of greenhouse gas emit greenhouse gases do not affect your local climate. It's, it contributes to a global problem, which changes the global weather cycles and patterns, and then that affects your local level. So even if you know Humboldt County had zero GHG emissions, it wouldn't matter. You still are going to have the problem, right? And that's why I was talking about that disconnect of you know I've, I've had people say to me. What does it matter what we do here in, in case of my city, San Luis Obispo, when China is building a coal plant every week? That's a tough question to answer. I go, yeah, I mean, you're, you're kind of right. I mean, the, the, you know, we could spend 20 years implementing our cap, and all that amounts to is was wiped out in one week in China by a coal plant. Uh, so it's it's that's one of the reasons it's harder to get people to care, but of course we have to because everybody's got to do their part. But this is a little bit easier because it doesn't matter, right? We're going to be affected and have to deal with it in some way. Um, so it also shows uh, uh, the map will show, will graph these uh, expected changes. And again, I, the, dis the scale it's displaying at is not very helpful. So, all right. Um, OK, so that's exposure. So we can identify our exposure. We can use the best science we have available to figure out How's our temperature going to change? How's our precipitation going to change? What kind of sea level rise are we going to expect? The second part of that, if you remember, is the notion of sensitivity. So we're going to be exposed to changes, but the next question is how sensitive are we to them, right? I mean, if I crank the heat up in here, you know, if I turned it up five degrees, yeah, it'd be a little warmer. I'd take my jacket off, but it wouldn't be a big deal. But if I increased it by 20 degrees, you'd all leave or fall asleep. Uh, hopefully you're not falling asleep anyways. Um, so the question is, how sensitive are we to these uh, changes? And to do that, we need to look at our community. And this is why the, the climate adaptation team is so critical. Because, yeah, we could have any scientist or engineer in the world come in and tell you what you're going to be exposed to. That science and information is out there. But the sensitivity question is about your community and what's sensitive in your community. And I don't live here. I don't know what's sensitive in your community. I don't know what's in the coastal zone. I don't know what kind of people live here. I don't know what they care about. I mean, I know a little bit. I certainly can read and talk to people. But really, this is where you know, the community's role is, is, is key and critical. And we think about it in sort of three, three realms. Uh, one is we think of assets. Uh, this is sort of the things. What are the things that make up this community? You know, the houses, the businesses, uh, the infrastructure roads, parks, wastewater treatment plants, water lines, all the physical things that sort of make up the community. Now, we care about things typically for the second reason, which is functions, right? These things do things for us. That's why we care about them. We don't care about the wastewater treatment plant just because it's a wastewater treatment plant. We care about it because it takes our wastewater out of our house for us. That's nice to have, uh, and cleans it. Uh, and treats it in a way that uh, hopefully doesn't harm the environment. Uh, and so there's a bunch of functions that happen in a community uh, that we care about, jobs, food, uh, mental health, public safety, on and on. Uh, and then there's people, of course. Uh, communities are made up of people. Uh, and in particular for climate adaptation, we typically are trying to ask ourselves, are there people in our community who are going to be particularly sensitive to the change in climate. Uh, if you're healthy and wealthy, then so what if it's going to get hotter in the future? Right? You'll sweat it out or crank up the air conditioning. Um, but if you have a compromised health system, heat might be the thing that, uh, that does you in. Um, if you're poor, you may not even have an air conditioner, uh, not to mention whether you can afford to operate the thing. Uh, at a level that would be uh, sufficient to uh, uh, cool you off. Uh, so we think about who in our community, what kinds of people, populations are going to be most sensitive to these things that we're going to be um, exposed to. OK, so when we have those two things, um, it's simply a matter of matching them up with each other uh, to assess uh, what are the potential impacts. Uh, if we've got sea level rise occurring in our community and we have critical infrastructure like our wastewater treatment plant or uh, parks and beaches located in these places, then uh, those are all potential impacts, right? So that mix of what are we exposed to and what's sensitive to those exposures begins to tell us impact. 
Uh, but there's two other pieces before we sort of fi finally say, okay, so this is our vulnerability. There's two other sort of modifications we want to make. Uh, and the first one is the issue, um, oh, so that, sorry, that's the potential impact. So for potential impact, we would think about, uh, you know, the, the time of this impact, how spatially large it is, how permanent it is, how it affects the population, how it affects our functions in our community, those sorts of things. The climate adaptation team would do this. Uh, and the suggestion here on qualitative categories uh, is, a, is a, a sort of a little caveat or warning I want to give you. Remember I talked about how the science isn't where we want it to be. It's not as good as we want it to be. I've seen communities sort of get in this, you know, well, if the sea level rise goes up six inches, you know, we're in trouble. But if it only goes up five inches, we're good. You know, sort of getting into the one inch. Well, we don't have the level of knowledge to know, you know, the, the error bars are in, the, are in the, the realm of, depending on who you ask, anywhere from six inches to six feet. Okay, so uh, arguing over, you know, an inch here, an inch there is not useful. So we say, don't get focused on the quantitative technical component of this and think about, you know, we've identified sea level rise. It's a potential problem. There's a potential range of impact. What might that do and how might we respond to it? So that's the qualitative idea. Okay, so uh, making some uh, adjustments. Um, uh, the first, oh, I don't have a slide on risk and onset. Yeah, I do. Okay. So the first is our risk and onset. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is acknowledge um, which of these potential uh, exposures uh, have higher degrees of uncertainty. Uh, and this is an area where we expect uh, the science to be improving over the next few years. And I kind of mentioned this before. And again, this is sort of the generic level that we're still working at. And this is global probabilities, I should add, global probabilities. So in other words, we know that temperature is going to change globally on average due to climate change with a greater than 90% probability now. But once we downscale that to any given region, these probabilities go uh, further down. And in fact, we haven't even estimate them, estimated them yet. So we don't have, for example, a California probability um, assessed because it's considered to be essentially incalculable right now. But we know it's lower than 90% and probably a fair bit lower than 90%. Precipitation is probably down around 30% uh, confidence that we know. So uh, we can look at these things and begin to say, well, we know issues around temperature and sea level rise. We know with a higher degree of certainty those are going to be a problem than we do precipitation. So it begins to tell us right off the bat that maybe that's where we should focus. Right? Given that we don't know as much about precipitation, if that's going to affect us, maybe that's something we deal with a little bit later and we focus right now on sea level rise or temperature because we know we have a higher sense of uh, probability that those are going to happen. The other thing that the CalADAPT tool will show you is it shows you change over time. And so the other consideration here is the onset. Um, uh, I mean, my general advice is, you know, we, we've, we needed to start 10 years ago or something on this. But the truth of the matter is, is with some of the climate impacts, we do have some time. If you have a wastewater treatment plant, we have one in Morro Bay down uh, near where I'm uh, at, uh, in Morro Bay, that will be susceptible to sea level rise. But honestly, we probably have about 30 years to do, to do something about it, right? It doesn't have to be done today. But we're probably going to need that because to get the money and figure out where to put it and Find a new site and all that, you know, that takes 30 years anyway. So uh, we probably do need to get started. But some things will happen on a longer time scale, and we have some time to plan and get them right. Other things we probably need to get on more immediately. So we want to take both of those uh, issues into consideration. Um, and then the second modifier that we want to think about is adaptive capacity. This is the idea that for some impacts that we will experience in our community, we are already prepared to deal with them. One good example is that um, in Southern California, uh, in Southern California, and I probably could get in trouble saying this, but uh, in Southern California, the change to wildfire um, is only expected to increase a little bit. In other words, wildfires are going to get a little worse in Southern California, not a lot worse. Um, Southern California is where I'm going to get in trouble is essentially prepared for wildfire. 
let's just say they're well practiced at it at this point. They probably could still do a better job. Uh, but they're well practiced at it. They have lots of assets in place. They spend a lot of money on wildfire. Um, I'll try to show you the map when I'm done at the end. Northern California, in some parts of Northern California, could see a tenfold increase in the extent of wildfire. Tenfold increase. Now, of course, up here in Northern California, you have assets in place to prepare and react to wildfire. But the climate model suggests, uh, and what we know of the asset base, is that you will not be prepared 50 years from now if you maintain your current asset base. Whereas again, in LA County, they don't have to do much, right? So this question of adaptive capacity is, do you already have the capacity effectively to deal with this? I gave you the Morro Bay wastewater treatment plant problem. That plan is very outdated. The city of Morro Bay is looking at moving it anyways, had begun to put money aside to do that. And so for them, the notion of moving the wastewater treatment plant is not a big deal. So we would say that they have adaptive capacity. In other words, they have the capacity now, today, to essentially deal with the problem effectively. They don't need to panic. They don't need to go looking for tons of new resources, that sort of thing. Okay? So this is another thing you'll want to do, is to look in our community. What are we already doing? What kinds of capacities do we have now? Because those problems, you can presume, you have the ability to deal with them what you want to identify is the problems where you have, you have little or no adaptive capacity at this point because you have to develop it, right? So you can almost categorize problems into two categories. Here's a set of problems or impacts we have. These we can deal with. We have the right tools. Um, here's another set we don't. And we suggest starting here, but it really goes beyond this, but certainly looking at your existing uh, planning and policy documents, but really it's moving into the community as well. Okay, so uh, once you've done all that, uh, community can then essentially identify its uh, vulnerability. Let me see how I'm on time. I wanna wrap up so I can have some Q&A. Um, the community can identify um, its level of vulnerability. So that answers that question. Uh, the next question is what to do about it. And I'm not gonna say too much. Uh, we can do some Q&A on this uh, if you want. Um, but uh, this would be the bottom half, which is to uh, you know, prioritize what are the big problems, uh, identify strategies, uh, evaluate and prioritize those strategies, and then ultimately to implement them. But I do want to leave you with um, a couple of ways to think about this. Let's see if this works. I'm going to blank that slide for a moment because I find the slide sometimes confuses people. So um, there's, a, there's a whole number of ways to think about this, but I want to uh, uh, give you as members of the public particularly one, a couple of ways to think about um, strategies and what's important and what's maybe less important. Um, one way is to think about these two issues of impact um, and uncertainty, okay? So, for example, um, we might identify, you know, 30 impacts in our community, potential impacts in our community. You know, the sea level rise is going to affect these assets out on the coast, temperature might change our, you know, some of our local crop regimes, whatever. Um, so I'm just making up numbers, say 30. Um, we can ask a couple things. One is we can say, you know, how, how big are these impacts in terms of their effect to our way of life, our social, economic, cultural, environmental stability? How big are these impacts? And obviously, ones that are bigger, you know, we're more concerned about, right? We would sort of prioritize those. Uh, the other is that we can uh, address the level of uncertainty. Uh, regarding the nature of these impacts, both from the exposure and the sensitivity side. The idea is that we want to prioritize big, big impacts that we have high certainty about. And we want to lower prioritize uh, low impacts that we have high uncertainty about, right? So in other words, we don't want to tackle the problems that we know are big problems, that we have a high degree of confidence are actually going to become problems, because all of this is prognostication. All this is trying to figure out what's going to happen in 2050 and 2100 in our community. So we want to tackle areas that are big and with high degrees of certainty and not get lost in the weeds of doing the, the things that have uh, low impact or low certainty. Um, okay, so anyways, it's not bringing my screen back. That's okay. The other, the, um, uh, the other thing you want to think about is essentially cost and benefits as well. So. 
Uh, as I said, with any policy action, there are typically co-benefits to it. There's other kinds of benefits it provides other than the direct one that we're trying to address. We want to figure out what are those benefits uh, that accrue to our community other than, well, we want to know the direct benefit, but we want to know the indirect benefits as well, and we want to assess and compare these against costs. So this is another way to look at that set of, say, 30 different actions, is to also compare them on this. What would it cost us to make this change, and what are the benefit that we're going to receive um, out of that? And it's not that we don't do all these actions ultimately, but again, in terms of priorities, we might want to prioritize uh, the ones that give us the biggest bang for the buck. But um, I will let you know it's not out for public review anymore. That's closed because we're about to actually produce the final report. In fact, in the next few weeks, the final report will be out. But if you want to get a taste of it now, you can go ahead and look at that one. But otherwise, I would say wait a few weeks because we've actually improved the readability considerably as well. Um, and so this is sort of the, this is sort of the uh, nighttime insomnia reading version. And we're trying to produce the exciting, stimulating morning reading version. Uh, that should be out in just a few weeks, uh, but keep an eye out uh, for that. Um, and then that's my contact information, and I'll see if we have any questions. And maybe we can, if you want, I'll try to bring up CalAdapt if you want, but, but why don't we do some questions first. When's this end? This ends at uh, 3, so we've got about 15 minutes. Yes, sir. Uh, you want to name names? China. China. You want me to answer how to deal with China? Um, uh, resurrect Nixon. Um, well, okay. Um, well, in terms, of, you know, I think the main resistance that you're going to face at a, at a um, I mean, we're talking about doing, the work that we're doing is talking about doing community level actions for greenhouse gas emissions reduction and climate adaptation. So that's been the focus of our work. So our perspective is what are the community, what are the community impediments going to be? I mean, I suppose global capital is an impediment or something, but, uh, no, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I can't answer that question. I mean, that's a. <laughs> I mean, how do you overcome money in politics? I mean, I you know, I, I, I'm an academic. Give me three more hours now. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Well, let me give you let me give you a few tips. No, I, I'm being a bit facetious with you about answering the question, although it is a nearly impossible question to answer. But let me give you a few things to think about. Um, there's there's some things we've begun to figure out, uh, particularly about. I'm going to start with the issue of you know climate change denialism and and confronting that level of opposition, which you will find both in members of the community, but in many cases you'll find also in elected officials as well, the ones you know, who are going to potentially do this process. Um, uh, there's a, quite a bit of good research that's been done now that's all pointed in the same direction, which is more science is not going to do the trick. Right? It's not about piling on the science till they're finally convinced they've read the 20th you know, report on the science of climate change and now they believe. Um, the, the research that's been done continues to show that people aren't convinced in that way. It doesn't convince them. So the person out there who says, I don't believe in climate change and this is some environmental international conspiracy and that sort of thing, isn't going to be changed by another report on science. Um, what we do know that has the potential uh, to change is to be able to put, um, is to communicate the issues of climate change in a way that speaks to their interests. Right? And there's, again, a variety of ways to do that. Uh, as I suggested the, early on, the, the, the primary reason we heard from communities justifying why they undertook climate planning was energy efficiency. And we dug a little bit on why was that the case, and it was pretty clear. Because we can go and sell that to people, to anybody. 
regardless of their political persuasion. If we can show them that the actions we're going to take are going to save money, then they're for it. Right now, not every action saves money, so you can't sell everything on saving money. But it's one, you know, that's one um, strategy. Uh, um, God, I hate when the cameras are on. I can't talk frankly in front of any people. All right, let's promise to edit the video, blur my face, and keep it in the room. Um, City of Palmdale. Anybody know anything about City of Palmdale? Palmdale? Anybody? Anybody from there? No. You, it's a city in the state of California. Um, no, Palmdale. It's down, you know, near LA. It's just over the mountains. Um, this is not a hotbed of environmental activism. I'm being kind for the cameras. <laughs> Palmdale. Palmdale adopted their climate action plan climate action plan on a five to zero vote after all of the uh, city council members wanted to make sure they are on record that uh, they didn't believe in climate change and and they thought this was some whole like conspiracy the state had cooked up now why did they do that why did they vote then 5-0 to adopt a climate plan anybody want to guess State does not require you to have a climate plan. Not require you. There's two reasons. The energy efficiency. One of the city council members, I, I can't quote him, I don't remember the quote exactly, but he'd read the plan and looked at it and he goes, well, a lot of these things are just common sense measures. Right? That's what he said. Or I'm paraphrasing. A lot of these things are just common sense measures. Yeah, insulate your house. Absolutely. We want to help our citizens in our community do that. All right, so that was one. The other, as I said, we don't get sued. There's a lot of lawsuits in California, some initiated by the Attorney General's office when uh, Governor Brown was Attorney General, some initiated by the Sierra Club and other organizations over communities not doing enough on climate change, and they've got some state law they can kind of rest on to make their cases. Most of these have been settled, few of them have gone to court, but generally this has been working as a strategy in many communities. I'm not telling you to go sue anybody, by the way. Um, but that was the other reason. Now, is that a good reason? Is it a global ethical reason that we would all hope they would have? No, it's not. But they now have an adopted climate action plan, um, which they seem, at least at this point, committed to try to move forward with. Right? It worked in that community. That's that community, right? It's a very different community than this community. Yes. Right. But the, the bottom line here is you got to figure out what speaks to someone's interests. And that's a question I can't really answer because there's hundreds of interests out there. But figuring out, you know, what's the motivator amongst this interest group? And I'm not going to say this works with everybody in every situation. But if you can make it work on enough people in your community, then you can get action going. But, you know, having another you know, public service announcement on how horrible climate change is going to be to us is probably not going to do it. Yeah, it's the, the messaging is key. The other, the other tidbit or tip I was going to give you is to figure out which institutions that are powerful are on board because there are many of them. PG&E, for example, is on board with assisting. They have a whole program now of assisting communities to do climate action planning. Well, PG&E is a politically powerful entity, and when they talk, people listen. Right? It's not like, hey, look, it's you know Professor Boswell, the crazy environmental academic guy. Uh, out there, it's PG&E, right? Corporate America here coming to speak about climate change and putting the money where their mouths are. So uh, that's the other, is to leverage institutions. The work we're doing is with the California Emergency Management Agency and the Natural Resources Agency. So, you know, we're able, we have the ability, those institutions have decided that climate adaptation is important. We're going to put money and technical assistance into it, and we're going to speak to communities. 
they can be your allies in helping communicate uh, the message. Although in some places, the state is, you know, well, you don't want the state involved. You want to keep them away because they're not uh, appreciated. But there are many, uh, uh, many different institutions uh, who have, who are interested in dealing with climate change now. And if you can get them on board to help you, uh, that can magnify your voice um, as well. In a regulatory context, do you see any of this policy manifesting itself in building codes or energy codes like California Green Code? Well, cer certainly in California it already has. I mean, we have the continued increase in the Title 24 uh, in terms of the building code. Um, you know, we have, we have the most, uh, we have the greenest building code in the country uh, in California. Um, so this is what I was talking about earlier, where in California, you know, I could probably, if I sat down and started writing it out, we probably have 30 or 40 different, um, you know, um, things that are pushing us in the right direction, whether it's the, you know, the, the changes to the building code, a whole variety of executive orders, various pieces of legislation, the coming cap and trade program. We have numerous um, um, uh, state laws and executive orders aimed at changing transportation infrastructure uh, and the way we do transportation in California. You know, we had to go fight federal lawsuits to be able to do that, and we won. Uh, so there's lots of different pieces pushing in California uh, in the right um, direction as well, which also is an ally. I mean, in a sense, we have the, we have the weight and direction of the law in terms of addressing adaptation and addressing climate change um, on our side. You know, the, the state, all the state agencies in California, I was talking about Caltrans with some folks last night, all the state agencies in California are under order by the governor, who is their boss, uh, to deal with climate adaptation. So if you speak to somebody at a state agency like Caltrans and they say, ah, oh, climate adaptation, we're not interested in that, uh, you know, you can show them the executive order from their boss saying, that's not what your boss says. Right. Now, that may or may not work on an individual, but institutionally, you know, th those tools are there as well. Yes? Um, my name is Sarah. Thank you for your discussion today. Sure. Um, so a lot of our planning seems to focus on projections for the future, and I'm curious about the opposite direction. Is there, like, a role in backwards um, to make a better plan for the future. And then I was just curious if you could give an example about um, some policy overlap, an example of how people are doing their clean water compliance to mm. get ready for climate change. Okay. So let's see. The first question is about looking looking back. Yes. Um, yes. I, 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 I wash my plastic bags because that's what my grandmother taught me to do. So. That's an example of looking back. No, I think we can look back and, and um, yeah, oh, I'm getting time. I'm getting times waved at me now. Awesome, thank you. Um, in terms of looking back, I don't know if you mean it in the sense of looking back for solutions to problems, and I think to a certain extent we do some of that. Like, to me, rain barrels are the, are the perfect example. Rain barrels are back in style now. People want rain barrels. Well, that's an ancient technology. <laughs> Uh, that we gave up on, and there's lots of good examples uh, like that. Uh, my grandfather never bought anything that he could figure out some way to make, and he made some wacky stuff. Um, but he was a very frugal person. Um, the, the other way you might think of looking back also is looking back in terms of understanding uh, how, our, how we've progressed over time such that we understand something about our future. Uh, and that's something certainly we do both in the emissions reduction work that we do and in the climate adaptation. Uh, we usually start with baseline years in the past to sort of understand what has been the progression over time um, of change. I, I, you may have noticed when I put the one Caladap map up that um, uh, you know the, the 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 projection, the future projections are like that, and they're scary. But I don't know if you noticed, but you know the the temperature, average temperature in this county is has, is different today than it was 20 years ago. Right, so the future is scary, but we've we've actually already experienced climate change here. The climate is different here in Cal in Humboldt County than it was 20 years ago due to global climate change. Only slightly different, but different. And so understanding that progression over time, and the scientists are spending a lot of time trying to understand, well, we've had climate change so far. What happened in that time, particularly with ecological species and things of that nature? What was that impact? If we can understand that, we can begin to understand better what we'll expect as it continues to change in the future. Uh, in terms of work, like, what do I do? Well, how does that affect your decisions today? I'm just curious if there's a role for that kind of research in planning. 
Yes, I think there is. I mean, I think in both ways. I think both the, you know, looking at um, technology that we've forgotten about or, you know, good ideas that were in the past that maybe we tweak or modernize in some way. I think we can always, you know, good planners, you know, steal their ideas all the time, right? Both from other, the, the peers and other cities, you know, if somebody else has figured out how to deal with sea level rise, it works for your community, why reinvent the wheel? So I think there's something to be said for looking at, looking in the, in the past and seeing if we have uh, things that we did in the past that would be effective solutions to some of these problems. Uh, uh, and then the other uh, component of it is the technical work of understanding what has happened in our recent past as a way of understanding what's going to happen uh, in our in our own coming future. Yeah. And then you had a second question about overlaps or something. I, I think this is a really good question. Um, you know, one of the one of the things we always do in terms of warning the opposite is to be careful that um, we're not doing things to solve one side of the climate change problem that exacerbate the other. And my favorite example are cooling centers. Uh, a lot of uh, communities that are suffering extreme heat have um, are, start, are uh, aiming a solution of cooling centers, of building cooling centers. Well, cooling centers are big electricity users, which means they generate more greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to the problem, you know, vicious cycle kinds of stuff. So looking for, making sure that if we're solving one problem, we're not creating um, another problem is, is um, something that we haven't done a good enough job at. We need to be very careful about. Um, but not just being risk averse, but actually looking for synergies as well. And that was the co-benefits example. Um, we don't need the threat of climate change to tell us to conserve water in California, right? I mean, we need to conserve water in California regardless of whether the climate's changing or not. Um, not so much up here, but where I'm from, it's a much bigger deal. Uh, uh, saving water, we're practically out of water as it is today. Um, and so looking for those policy synergies that where a certain action solves multiple problems, not just a single problem, that's the co-benefit idea and that's the most effective way to sell, um, uh, 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 sell some of these policy actions as well. So uh, I think we got time for one more question and then they're going to give me the boot. Um, um, one is just kind of a comment. If people are interested in what's going on as far as climate action planning locally, the I'm with the Redwood Coast Energy Authority, and we're working with the city of Arcata on uh, updating their inventory and then completing inventories for, for all the cities. So we're, we're working with all the cities in the county to, to do the inventory stage of that five-step process and then moving on uh, in the future to the, the, the action planning stage. And the, so if people are interested in that on the local level, you can, you can contact us about where things are at with that. Um, the question I had was on the, the adaptation planning side of it. Mm -hmm. um, are there any examples you know of, of communities that have kind of, that are already far, fairly far along in the process that are, have kind of done an adaptation plan and then in particular, you know, smaller communities since, you know, our biggest city is 28,000 people and so, you know, it's always kind of what's a, a lean, mean strategy to, to do it for a, you know, a small community that doesn't have a lot of resources. Right. And are there examples of that? Um, good examples of small communities that have done it. I probably don't, because my usually first example is New York City, which uh, New York City is probably, I don't know if it's fair to say, but they've certainly got to be one of the top few national leaders in addressing uh, their vulnerability to climate change at this point. They've really done just an amazing, very active job uh, there. Um, and for some obvious reasons, particularly sea level rise, which could be uh, absolutely devastating to the economy of New York uh, City. Um, San Diego, uh, San Diego has done quite a bit, and some of the smaller communities I know in San Diego County have been actively involved in that process, but I can't name any in particular. Uh, not a lot of climate adaptation planning has been done yet. That's part of the reason that the state has decided to do this work, is to try to get communities to get doing it. Um, unlike the greenhouse gas emissions reduction, where I can give you tons of examples. Um, Key West, Key West, Florida. Um, I don't know how similar they are to here, with well, not very in many ways, but they are a coastal community. Um, that uh, I think the highest point in Key West is like six feet above sea level. So you can imagine what they think of, you know, a couple meters of sea level rise. Um, and then there's quite a few Bay Area communities as well that have begun the process, uh, particularly um, in the uh, uh, East Bay uh, area as well. But I, I don't have any good city examples, but I'll, I'll give you another tip 
in terms of um, thinking about one way to deal with this problem. Um, I don't know, that, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's the case. Well, I, I can give you two ways. Every city in California has to do a safety element of their general plan. A safety element is a great place to, you know, sort of house climate adaptation strategies or deal with them. So that's, you know, if your community is updating its general plan and they're updating the safety element, that's a real opportunity uh, to address adaptation uh, issues. The other is a, if your community has a local hazard mitigation plan, which I would bet Arcata does, I don't know for sure, uh, you're, they're not required to have them, but about 75% of cities in California have them. Uh, I would suspect Arcata does. Uh, they're required to update it every five years, and whatever their next update cycle is, the, the California Emergency Management Agency will be asking them to address climate adaptation in that local hazard mitigation plan. They won't be expecting a lot out of them in it, but they will have to at least broach that topic, do some basic assessment, and, and develop some basic policy. But with a stronger push from the community, that could be per perhaps enhanced. So they're going to give me the hook. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.